<laughs> except they except they steal things. So, yeah. but but the, that can that can be worked yeah, exactly. I wasn't paying attention. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, so I'm Dave Hinkle. I'm going to go over a topic that uh, I get asked a lot of questions about. <clears throat> Sorry for the old guy following the young guys and the dry topic following the more more fun, upbeat topic. But um, this is a, <clears throat> this is a uh, very hot topic, um, probably not for really sound reasons, but I get enough questions about it in clinic that I uh, decided to give a little overview. <clears throat> so um, TV, internet, uh, paraquat lawsuits, um, and this is just pulled from a lawyer's website. If you or a loved one has been exposed to paraquat and developed Parkinson's disease, you may have a lawsuit. And how the heck did we get to this, that we're actually suing over paraquat uh, for Parkinson's? So actually, it came from um, people injecting themselves with drugs um, about 40, 50 years ago, and then about 30 years ago. Um, there's a, a book written, um, uh, The Case of the Frozen Addicts, that, that described uh, there were four people in the 1980s who were making synthetic heroin in their garage. And they injected themselves with it, and about a day later, they were completely frozen. They, were, they had acute, very, very... Uh, horrific advanced Parkinsonism, unlike what anyone with Parkinson's disease would ever experience. And so <clears throat> this, this actually opened the door to, inadvertently, to a huge field of science um, and endeavor within Parkinson's disease. So what, in a nutshell, was learned was that um, a chemical called MPTP, uh, methylphenol tetrahydropyridine um, was a byproduct of what they were making. MPTP is at certain doses very selective for killing dopamine cells in the brain and everyone's heard of dopamine by now and uh, the deep cells of the brain that use dopamine are the cells that help us to have big fast movements loose enough muscle tone that we can move and limit tremor. <clears throat> so these, these folks basically would just torched away their, their dopamine cells and became very rigid, very slow, basically immobilized. Um, and I've already said that part. Acute Parkinsonism, four people in 1983. So MPTP, the chemical, is very similar in structure to paraquat. So some enterprising scientists started thinking, well, what, what if um, paraquat um, and other chemicals like it, herbicides and pesticides in the environment are causing Parkinson's disease? If, if this MPTP can cause it quickly in a high dose, <clears throat> we know we're being exposed to these chemicals in our food, water, Maybe there's something to what we call idiopathic Parkinson's disease or kind of Parkinson disease in general. So the question became, is paraquat environmental exposure linked to Parkinson's disease? And <clears throat> the sentence is kind of important, link. So epidemiological studies, let me see what my next, yeah. So epidemiological studies, can I go back? I can go back. There we go, the red one. So epidemiological studies were done looking at different industries, um, so people that apply herbicides and pesticides, people exposed to well water. So if you're on a farm and you have your own well, does all the pesticide you're using kind of collect in the well and then you drink it? Um, is there a link? <clears throat> Epidemiolog epidemiological studies link things together. They don't prove causation. So maybe someone who's applying paraquat over 50 years gets Parkinson's disease, but maybe that person's also eating broccoli 
10 times as much as the average person. Maybe the broccoli is causing it, not the paraquat. So their linkage, um, there's a, epidemiological linkage does not prove causation. But um, what came out of these studies was that there is a, a very strong correlation actually um, across the world between long-term chronic low-level herbicide exposure, herbicides like Paraquat, pesticides, there are a whole bunch of pesticides that are, that uh, chronic exposure is associated with a high risk of Parkinson's disease. Rotenone actually is a, a very, very well-known model system in, in uh, uh, animal models for Parkinson's disease. Well water consumption, that goes way back in terms of the association. It's probably related to the above. It's probably your, your wells are, are kind of collecting these chemicals. And then more recently, there's been a fervor over milk and dairy, and it kind of goes back to the same thing. Maybe the cows are eating a lot of the, the, the plants that have pesticides, herbicides on them, concentrating it in the milk, and then we're drinking the milk. So I, don't, I, I really don't think that drinking milk or drinking water is dangerous, but you know, that's, that's probably, probably why those, those associations have occurred. So just to, to flip it over, there are also correlations between other things and reduced risk for Parkinson's disease. So cigarette smokers, um, now the, the message here is not to go start smoking, please don't, don't, please don't. Dr. Hinkle said I should start smoking, that's not what I'm saying. But there's a correlation between cigarette use and reduced risk for Parkinson's disease. Um, people have, have studied nicotine patches, people have kind of taken this to all levels to try to figure out why. Again, there's an association. So it might be that the cigarette users are, are I don't know, they're doing something else that reduces their risk. Caffeine use, um, co uh, caffeinated coffee in particular, again, associated with reduced risk. And one of the medications used by now, or, or uh, that is out now, called istradefiline, is actually based on this correlation because istradefiline and caffeine are chemically similar. Um, and I think the science behind it is probably not that great, but there's some symptomatic benefit, and so it's something that is potentially used. But that's where it came from, the caffeine. Association between um, non-aspirin, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, so ibuprofen in particular, higher use. Now, maybe that's because people who are exercising are hurting more and using more ibuprofen, so it's actually the exercise that's protective versus the ibuprofen itself. Statin use, beta blocker uh, use, so um, propranolol. Um, so there, there are a few associations there. And then um, a lot of what we're doing here is based on, again, epidemiology showing that people that exercise more have a lower risk of Parkinson's disease. And a lot of the early studies were done, people who were former college athletes um, had lower risk. So again, it's not, this does not mean that these are protective influences necessarily. We don't know that, but there are correlations. But this is where all of the exercise work came from, the, the association. So as I've said a few times now, correlation does not equal causation. So we don't have evidence that smoking cigarettes will protect you. We don't have evidence that exercise will protect you. We also don't have great evidence that paraquat herbicides, pesticides are really causing Parkinson's disease despite these correlations. Um, but Obviously, it raises interesting questions. There's, there's, there's got to be something uh, mechanistic behind the correlation. So scientists uh, looked at paraquat in uh, different levels of experimental models and also looked at Parkinson's disease in terms of, of human brains uh, at autopsy. And lo and behold, um, 
a lot of the kind of in vogue uh, mechanisms of uh, neural damage, oxidative stress, um, apoptosis, uh, mitochondrial toxicity, neuroinflammation, dopamine cell toxicity. It's not critical uh, in terms of the actual mechanisms, but the, the yes, yes, yes box is, is more relevant that there's a lot of overlap between what we see in Parkinson disease and what Paraquat can do in the brain. And dopamine toxicity, um, producing Parkinsonism, slowness of movement, stiffness of movement, animal models, um, really kind of bridges the gap there scientifically. And so what, what might be happening or what's, what's being uh, opined to happen uh, behind the lawsuits um, is, is that uh, perhaps exposure in the environment to, uh, to Paraquat is, is uh, causing Parkinson's disease. So I have a few slides where I'm kind of using this, this uh, graph representation. Paraquat has a kind of a two-level effect here. We're going to have a higher dose going up this way, longer duration of time, and then development of Parkinson's disease, um, again, assuming that Paraquat is really relevant. So in this particular example, <clears throat> if this person, let's say, is exposed to this amount of Paraquat for this long, it's not doing any damage. It's not kind of crossing that line to cause Parkinson's disease. So, that dose of Paraquat for that amount of time hasn't caused damage that will cause Parkinson's disease. But if we take that same person and we expose them to a lot more, a much higher dose over the same amount of time, we tenfold the dose, maybe the dose effect is that it is now toxic to the nerve cells and causes Parkinson disease. Another way to look at it, what if we keep the dose the same, so it's a, you know, a one-time or one-fold dose of the, of the toxin, but we expose that person longer and longer. So at age 20, exposed in the fields to paraquat, not enough time, not enough time, but damage is being done, damage is being done, and so at age 80, that's a long enough exposure time to that dose for them to develop Parkinson's disease. Again, I'm not saying that this is true, <laughs> but this is the idea about environmental toxins and the risk for Parkinson's. A dose and amount of time of exposure effect. Now, we've already heard a little bit about this. There are other components of this. So, um, there may be um, genetic components of a person's makeup where they can be exposed to a higher dose of something in the environment for longer, but they battle it back better. So my brother and I, if we had, were still living in Baltimore where we grew up and were exposed to the same foods, same drinks, same air, same environmental toxins, but he has something about him in, in terms of genetics. So I'm a little bit taller. He's a little bit shorter and bigger. We, you, we, you know we're brothers, but you can tell us apart. So our genetics are slightly different that you can tell us apart. There might be something similar in terms of our differences where he's got something going on biochemically that can protect him against these toxins until he's 60, but I have something going on that protects me till I'm 160. So he gets Parkinson's disease, but I don't because I don't live to 160. So in this case, if my genetics are a little bit protective, it's gonna kind of move that line up a bit. And so in, in me, compared to my brother, the dose, the amount of toxin exposure over this amount of time doesn't affect me because I have some type of protective influence. And so that's what's depicted here. It would take, in theory, either 
a higher dose of the toxin exposure over the same amount of time or a longer time. So I'd have to live in a different place that has more toxin or I'd have to live to 160 years old to actually uh, get Parkinson's disease. Another way to look at it is, as we heard earlier, there are quite a few genes that when mutated will cause Parkinson's disease and there are probably a hundred genes now that when altered increase the risk for Parkinson's disease but don't actually cause it themselves. So they are doing something that reduces the capacity of that person's brain to protect itself against Parkinson. So this is again the same person at the start. If someone has a Parkinson disease mutation, maybe what's happening is that it's kind of changing their susceptibility to the environmental toxin such that at the same dose they'll get it younger because it doesn't take as long of an exposure to the same amount uh, to develop Parkinson's disease. So what it really kind of comes down to is, and you know, I'm, I'm using Paraquat as an example, but kind of the, the general thought process around Parkinson's disease right now is that there's a, there are genetic factors of susceptibility or protection, and then th there are environmental factors, maybe pesticides, maybe herbicides, maybe other things. Uh, scientists have looked at all kinds of chemicals. But we have different individuals in the environment, so if this is Columbus, and we've got a certain amount of paraquat kind of running around in the water in Columbus, and then we've got all the different people living in Columbus. Um, if, if, again, if this is really true, which we don't know, but if this is true and we all live here our entire lives, a person that has this kind of genetic uh, capacity to protect is going to get Parkinson's disease a little younger. Whereas this person, it would either take more toxin or a longer period of time and then this guy over here might have to live to 200 years old before he or she got Parkinson's because they've got some type of genetic um, protective mechanisms that just make just protect them or uh, render them less susceptible. So question really comes back to does Paraquat cause Parkinson's disease? And in more general terms, do herbicides, do pesticides really cause Parkinson's disease? And the honest answer is we really don't know. Um, we can take herbicides, we can take pesticides, we can put them in cell culture dishes and kill cells. It's a dose-dependent, length-dependent fashion. I, used to, I did this for 20 years before I came to Ohio Health doing um, molecular biology experiments and, and using rote known and things and exposing higher doses, longer periods of time, less periods of time. We can kill cells in the dish. We can kill cells acutely in rats and mice. But that's toxic, that's kind of acute toxic Parkinsonism like the, the uh, people injecting the MPTP heroin analog got. So, as far as human Parkinson disease goes, we just really don't honestly know the answer to this right now. Um, but what the majority of, of scientists and physicians think is that, and, and this doesn't just go for Parkinson's, this goes for cancers, this goes for probably dementias, this goes for a lot of what we are, 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 are experiencing in, in, our, in, our, in terms of our medical uh, uh, histories. There's a balance between nature or genetic susceptibility and nurture or the environment. And we'll just say toxins for the moment because they're, you know, we're exposed to things all the time and we, we hope to keep a balance between the two. So, you know, the Paraquat lawsuit, it's based again on chemical structure being similar to an agent that some kids injected that killed off their dopamine cells 
some, some uh, epidemiological studies that show correlation, some experiments that show that you can acutely kill dopamine cells, but when it comes right down to paraquat and human Parkinson disease, we really don't know. Um, so I really think that the lawsuits are a little premature, but, you know, people uh, just look at what's going on around us. Uh, people will jump on anything to, to uh, get something from it, and I really think that's what's happening here. We're jumping a few steps ahead and, and making assumptions that, that just haven't been proven. So um, what it comes down to is go ahead and keep eating, drinking, breathing, living, enjoying, exercising, doing your thing because and not smoking. <laughs> and I finished hopefully well before my allotted time, which is uncharacteristic for me. We'll also heat the place a little bit more next time I see the gloves on over here. <laughs> okay. So I am happy to take questions. Online. First one, how can they ever prove the environmental correlations or actual causes? What kind of research will prove these and move from hypothetical to fact? <laughs> Thank you very much <laughs> for that question that has been posed um, in, in grants and at scientific symposia for the last 20, 30 years. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, the question is, how, okay, well, that's you know, nice, nice little presentation there. You're, you're, you're showing why paraquat is, is a concern, and then you're saying, well, we don't really know, but how are we ever going to know? And part of it, you know, we're never going to be able to, you know, the, the, the way to prove it is not something we can do. It's to take a group of people and expose them to paraquat at certain doses and, and let them live for 50, 60, 70 years and see if they develop Parkinson's disease versus a, a, a placebo control. So we can't do that. Um, the, one, one of the problems currently with, with uh, clinical trials looking for um, what is protective against Parkinson progression is that we really don't have a good way to study it. We have um, you know, in our SPARKS trial, we spend a lot of time um, doing something called a unified Parkinson's disease rating scale where we ask questions about symptoms and then I do an examination. We give it number scores and we kind of follow number scores over time and as the scores go up or as, the, as Parkinson's progresses, the scores will go up a little bit so you can follow numbers. But pretty much everything we have in that regard is symptom-based. So we can put you on a medication and improve your symptoms. We can have you on an exercise regimen and improve symptoms, and then the number scores will go down. We have something called a dopamine transporter scan that can, in a way, measure the amount of dopamine cells that you have still alive at a given point in time. But if any, you know, anyone that's ever seen a dopamine scan, which I usually show to people in the office, if I do them, they're not common. Um, it's kind of a fluffy, uh, fuzzy scan. It's not very quantifiable. So it, it doesn't show with any precision how many dopamine cells you have. There's a huge push now in, in research to try to find biomarkers. So try to find imaging studies that will actually count numbers of cells or that will actually show the pathology. Or is there some type of blood test that will correlate if you have, if you have one microgram of something you're at stage this, you have 10 micrograms of something, you're at stage this, something that you can actually measure what's happening in here. The deep brain areas uh, that are having difficulty for the dopamine problems, the stiffness, slowness, tremor, about the size of an uncooked piece of rice. Believe it or not, that little bit of tissue causes those problems. We, we can't MRI that. We can't we just don't know what's happening biochemically down there. What we really need to know is when Parkinson's develops in somebody, what's happening then? Because that's what we really want to know to be able to intervene. We can look at someone's brain 40 years in after they're finished using it at autopsy. 
and see what's, what was happening then and what was happening over the, you know, the months that they were going through a decline, but we don't know what that means in terms of what's happening early. So to cut to the chase, we don't really have still really good, reliable ways to measure disease progression in a person. And so to get back to the original question of how do we, how do we prove the paraquat? How do we prove, um, it's, it's a tough one. I, I, don't, I don't know of an experimental model um, unless you, know, you, you have a population of people that you follow for their whole lives in a completely paraquat free environment. I don't, I'm not, it's, it's a tough question to get at, but um, on the other side of it, it, it absolutely hasn't been proven. So it's, it's, um, it's again correlation and not, not uh, uh, clearly um, uh, proven as causation. So that's a little bit of a dancy answer, but that's about what I can give you. I mean, there's, it, you, there isn't, the, the experiment to do is not something that would be ethical. <laughs> um, you, you already answered this part of okay. how do we move legislation forward to protect people from these environmental hazards. And then the next question is, how did Agent Orange become a cause, whereas the others are more correlation? Yeah. Or so, is it still a correlation as well, which yeah. I think it is. So way. Agent Orange, um, the question is, how did Agent Orange become a cause, whereas the others are correlations? The quick answer is, um, it's, it's a herbicide, exfo herbicide, I think, um, and um, I, when I was in Pittsburgh, I worked at the Pittsburgh VA, um, and I remember uh, veterans uh, being, you know, wondering about Agent Orange exposure and Parkinson's, and all of a sudden the VA just decided that we're going to um, service connect you 100% for exposure to Agent Orange. It absolutely floored me because there is no... Again, there is there's no evidence that Agent Orange causes Parkinson's disease. Um, there is, um, it, it's really what it came down to is it was linked to herbicide pesticide and um, correlations with perhaps higher um, higher risk for developing. So I was actually surprised that the VA covered it. I was happily surprised. Um, I don't think. Uh, just because something isn't proven doesn't mean that it, it isn't actually happening or that it shouldn't, you shouldn't be helped um, for that. So, um, but it's still a correlation to answer the question. It's not a cause. Um, the VA recognizes it and therefore people are covered. So, and, and in terms of, you know, uh, the protecting people against environmental toxins, well, you know, the herbicides, pesticides have been identified, but there are lots of things in the environment that haven't been looked at. And again, it might be, <clears throat> it might be something else under those circumstances. It's, 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 a, it's a very tough question. And I know certain types of pesticides have been banned um, because of concern but then you'll also get into the politics of, of uh, you know, big farming and using, you know, it, it, it gets to be a complex issue. So these are not answers to the questions I know, but I don't, no one has an answer yet. Any other questions I can't answer? <laughs> or, or that I don't do a good job answering? <laughs> okay, sir, yes. The Roundup lawsuit is not Paraquat. Roundup is not Paraquat. It's, I can't, I can't remember what Roundup is. I'd have to get my, what's that? Okay. And that's, isn't that with lymphoma? Do I remember? Yeah. I mean, I, very honestly, I, I think that it's nature nurture. I think it's genetic susceptibility. I think it's environmental toxins at certain levels, and there's paraquat, and there's rotenone, and there's X, Y, and Z running around, and we're exposed to it at different levels, and, and I think that that's what is happening in, in 
cancers, and I think it's, it's part of what uh, makes us susceptible to all types of things. And people are trying to figure out what's what and trying to figure out protective measures, but it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's like doing an experiment where you take 20 different types of rats and putting in a thousand chemicals and then trying to figure out what did what. That's kind of what the experiment is right now, and that's what makes it so tough. And Parkinson's, or keep in mind that you know, Parkinson's is not a cookie cutter disease, and you know, no two patients are the same, which is what makes cause research and things very unique for Parkinson's specifically, because we don't have biomarkers, we don't have animal models, even when we have research that we study things in animals and then we try to apply that to Parkinson patients. A lot of the stuff doesn't work because, you know, an animal model is every animal model gets MPTP, gets, gets known, and so every animal is exactly the same, and, but not every person and not every Parkinson patient is the same. So when we try to apply that to human and human research, it changes drastically because everyone responds so differently. The disease is so unique to every individual. Um, and so that's where I think with Parkinson research and trying to figure out these sort of things becomes a, a challenge in the Parkinson world because we don't have that. Everyone's so different. And another component of that <laughs> is, is why the, the, the clinical trials, one sec, thanks, um, are being turned around a little bit. The, the, the free genetic studies that you heard about. Um, a lot of the clinical scientists have been saying, and I think it's very appropriate, let's try to look at more ge genetically defined populations. So let's look at, let's find people with gene X Parkinson disease, gene Y Parkinson disease through these, through these free surveys, get a, get a group of 100 or 1,000 people with gene X mutation Parkinson's, and then if there's a compound that might work on that type, let's test it there. And if it works, then we can apply it back because that's part of the issue. We're taking, we're taking all comers. I mean, there, there were about a decade and a half ago, um, there was a big push, a big consideration for causing it, call, calling Parkinson's disease Parkinson's syndrome to recognize that everybody's different. Some people are very tremor prominent. Some people more of a gait disorder, walking disorder. Some people develop Parkinson's at 40, some at 90. So it's not, it's not one thing. And so doing human trials, you're looking at everything. So trying to make a more genetically defined population to get more information is the way that the field's going. That's why Michael J. Fox Foundation, Parkinson Foundation, other groups are trying to get genetically defined populations to try to get studies that are more informational to then take to other groups. Sorry, yes. So the question is about the genetic testing for predisposition towards whatever. Uh, so that yeah um, so the first question about um, genetic susceptibility and testing for that so so in, in theory yes you could do genetic testing for you know the 30 or however many genes there are um, it would require a lot of money. Um, it would be thousands of dollars to do that testing per person at the moment. Now, if, if a company came up with a little profile, um, might be able to do that more, more uh, in a more economically uh, appropriate way. The problem is you don't know. Um, there's uh, having a, a 
a genetic mutation doesn't always predict that you're going to have the disease. I think for Parkinson's, it's called penetrance. So 100% penetrance means that if you have the mutation, you're going to get the disease. Um, with Parkinson's disease, I don't actually I don't know. I know for for some disorders, it's it's uh, uh, like 50% penetrance. Um, so right now. Uh, it would be an expensive proposition, and we wouldn't be able to tell you if you'd have Parkinson's disease, when you'd have it. We don't have a disease-modifying drug that's been proven, so we don't have anything we could do with the information. We're getting close to time, aren't we? I can tell. Um, um, so right now, I could imagine in the future um, we have a cure for Alzheimer's, we have a cure for Parkinson's, we have a cure for these things. You get your your blood tests done, including your panel for Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, etc. Oh, you've got this. You're going to get Parkinson's. We'll give you this drug to keep you from ever having it. I can see that type of. It, we're not there yet. The other question, long long term, there is. There's a Michael J. Fox. Oh, I can't remember the name of it, but there is a there is a longitudinal study through Michael J. Fox where you can actually. I'm blanking on the name, but they, they basically, you fill things out quarterly and they follow you. It's a natural history study, and there are other natural history studies that are going on. So there are... Yeah, yeah it's, it's yeah. being done. I don't remember the name of it. Link, not luck, no. Yep. Any other? I think we're at time. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone.